work out what this cookie is made of? Well, you could read the ingredients list on the Maryland cookies packet. You could contact the manufacturers. Uh, you could eat one, which would be my preferred option. Um, a particle physicist would do this. So, I conclude that this cookie was made of uh, chocolate chips and dough. But if I want to know what the dough was made of, I have to throw that cookie even harder. Uh, and if I wanted to know what the particles of the dough that made the dough up were made of, I would need to throw it so hard that not even I could manage that. Now we're talking the speed of the light. But thankfully I don't have to do that because we have something else for the job. Introducing the particle accelerator. Now all particle accelerators have some basic components. They have a source of particles, a beam pipe that the particles travel through, an electric field that accelerates the particles, a magnetic field that changes their direction, and a target that you smash the particles into. This gives you the very easy to remember acronym of SPENT. That's SPENT. Now, the first type of particle accelerator is called a linear accelerator. And this is how it works. So in this case, we're going to start off with a negatively charged particle, and that's going to enter the beam pipe. This section here starts off positively charged, and the positive and negatively charged sections alternate as you go down the tube. Okay, so positive, negative, positive, negative. So when I send my electron into the tube, It is attracted towards this positive charge, it's actually accelerating. But then we have a problem. Because now it's approaching something that's negatively charged. So you're about to undo all the good work that you put in. So what do you do? Well thankfully, these sections are connected to an alternating supply. So what happens is that the charges on each of these sections alternate. This section is now positive, that's negative, positive, negative. And so the electron can be accelerated again. And these charges constantly alternate all the way down the tube. Accelerating the electron throughout the process. Until it slams into a target. Now, these are great, but they have their limitations. Um, one limitation is that you are limited by how long you can build the accelerator, which ultimately is limited by the curvature of the Earth. So a way of solving this is to try and get the particles to move in a circle, so you don't have to build such a long line. Introducing the cyclotron. Now, the components of the cyclotron are, you have two Ds, called Ds because they look like the letter D. Uh, so these are the green sections left and right, and these have an opposite charge from one another. So if this D on this side is positively charged, then this D on that side will be negatively charged. Okay, so they always have the opposite charge. And across the Ds, there is a magnetic field, in this case going into the screen. And what that means is that a charged particle here will spiral throughout the Ds until eventually it slams into a target over there. That requires a little bit more explanation. Okay, so we start off with the same scenario. Positively charged D on this side, negatively charged D on that side. Okay, that's negative, that's positive. And the particle in this case is a positively charged particle. We'll call it M Paul. Okay, so Paul, the positive charge, starts here. And naturally, he's in an electric field, and he's going to accelerate 
towards the negative charge. So it gets faster and faster and faster until he reaches this D here. Now, at this point, he's no longer in an electric field, so he's not getting any faster in a straight line. But he's at the mercy of the magnetic field going into this screen, going across the D. So what the heck happens to it? Well, for this, you can use a hand rule to help you out. You use your left hand if it's a positive charge, and your right hand if it's a negative charge. How do you remember that? Watch, this is great. You hold your hands like this, you curl your fingers over, and your left hand looks slightly more like a P than the right hand. It took me literally an hour to come up with that, so if you don't like it, tough. So we're going to use our left hand because Paul's a positive charge. Now, how do you use the left hand? Well, first of all, position your thumb, index finger and middle finger at 90 degrees to one another. And we're going to use FBI. FBI. F stands for force, so your thumb is going to point the direction that Paul is going to be forced. B stands for the magnetic field. Now, that B does actually stand for magnetic induction, so that's not as stupid as it sounds. And I, as it always has, stands for the current, so the flow of charge. In this case, the direction that Paul is moving in. So let's go and apply this hand rule to this scenario. Okay, the magnetic field, which is your, your index finger, right, remember, FBI, is going into the screen. Paul, our charge, is moving that way, so there's a current that way. So that means your middle finger points like that. If you lift your thumb up, the force is going upwards. Paul is going to experience a force upwards. And so he curves around. What changes here? Well, now Paul is moving upwards. But this time, the force exerted on him is moving in that direction, based on my thumb. Long story short, Paul curves all the way around until he reaches the electric field region again. But I, we've got another problem. Remember, Paul's positively charged. And that's positively charged D. He's not going to want to go towards that D. So the same solution that you had for the linear accelerator, you alternate the charges. So this D becomes negative, that D becomes positive at just the right time to give Paul another boost. The magnetic field then changes Paul's direction, the charges switch over, and Paul gets another acceleration. So on and so forth until eventually he slams into the target out here. Now, even cyclotrons are limited. And they're limited, again, by how big you can build this chamber. Okay, the bigger the chamber, the faster they go. So, I wonder if there'd be a way of continually accelerating particles at the same radius, constant, introducing the synchrotron. This is what the Large Hadron Collider uses, and it's got all the main components of spirit. So it's got a source of particles down here, it's got a beam pipe that they travel through, it's got an accelerator section here, which will have an electric field, it's got a magnetic uh, electromagnets all the way around here that change the direction of the particle and it's got a target as well although the target for this tends to be an oppositely moving beam of particles that slam in head on. <coughs> okay, why use electromagnets and not permanent magnets? Okay, well to answer that, imagine that it's a Friday night and you want to go out with your mates, where do you go? You go to the play park. And uh, when you're at the play park, let's say you're at the roundabout, and your mate's pushing you around the roundabout, you, to begin with, don't have to hold on that hard. Right? If the roundabout's going slowly, you can just gently hold on. But the faster your mate pushes you this wild Friday night, 
um, the more force you have to exert on the roundabout to stop you flying off at a tangent. Right? It's the same with this. If I rotate this quite slowly, I don't need to hold on to the string very tightly, but the faster that I rotate the ball, the harder I need to hold on to the string. Okay, it's the same with the synchrotron. The faster these particles are traveling, the more likely they are to veer off at a tangent and hit the side of the tube. And you don't want that, okay? You want to keep accelerating them. This is why we use electromagnets and not just permanent magnets. Because the faster that these particles go, the stronger we need the magnetic field to be to keep them going in that same loop. Just like the stronger you need to use your muscles to hold on to the roundabout. So, those are particle accelerators. Um, so the next time that you accidentally break somebody else's property, uh, you can just say, I'm really sorry, I'm, I'm a particle physicist and I just wanted to know how your phone worked. <laughs>